All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our seminar series, COVID-19 and the Law. The session is the healthcare system in the age of COVID-19. We are going to wait just a moment to allow Zoom to load everybody into the webinar. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Carmel Schaffer. I'm the executive director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. I am delighted to welcome you to the last of our seminar series on COVID-19 and the law. This is a series that we have been organizing in collaboration with our friends at the Solomon Center for Health Law and Policy at Yale Law School that explores all of the different facets of public policy and law that have been impacted in the last year by the pandemic. Before I talk about this panel specifically, a few items of housekeeping, the virtual equivalent of how to find the bathroom. We welcome questions from the audience. In fact, we strongly encourage it. There will be a Q&A period at the end of this event. How can you submit your questions? You can do it in two ways. The best way is to submit your question, which you can do at any time during this event, using the Zoom Q&A feature, which is found in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. We will be monitoring that. I will be pulling questions to ask the panelists through that. You are also welcome to join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag COVID law policy. Again, that's hashtag COVID law policy. If you ask a question, using that hashtag, the Petrie Flom staff will pull that and put it into the Zoom Q&A so that we can include it in the Q&A. Ways that you cannot ask a question. The Zoom raising your hand feature results in a really cute hand being raised, but we will not be monitoring that. So please do not use that. We also will not be using the chat for any questions. So please don't try to submit using the chat. We, this might be the last of our seminar series, but we have a ton of great events. In fact, tomorrow we have a great panel discussing the privatization of public health. I suspect that if you're interested in that, that you may want to sign up for our newsletter, which is the best way to find out about our events. We've included the link on the panel on the slide deck that you're seeing right now, or you can go to our website. The Solomon Center also has some amazing events. I very often look at them and I wish that I had thought about that panel or put it together. So if you are interested, please email health.law at yale.edu to subscribe or follow their Twitter. All right. So today's panel really focuses on the impact that the pandemic has had on our healthcare system, on the delivery of healthcare. And I think it's a really interesting wrap up to our seminar series, which started kind of very theoretical in the practice of health law, and then moved to be very broad. We explored issues around the impact that COVID had on climate change, on mass incarceration. And now we're really talking about squarely the impact on the healthcare system. And we're going to explore it from many different angles, including healthcare financing, including the expectations that we have for our medical providers, really just across the gamut. With that, I'd like to welcome our speakers and in no particular order, that, that is how they will present. Our first speaker will be Ryan Knox, who is a senior research fellow at the Solomon Center for Health Law and policy at Yale Law School. Following him will be Nina Cohn, the David M. Levy Professor of Law at Syracuse University College of Law and Distinguished Scholar in Elder Law at the Solomon Center for Health Law and Politics. Then we have Matt Lawrence, who is Associate Professor of Law at Emory Law School, followed by Richard Faber, 
Arch T. Allen Distinguished Professor of Law, University of North Carolina School of Law. And wrapping up the panel will be Victoria TSB, Director of Research Science at New York Presbyterian Hospital. Each of them will present, and then we will have the Q&A at the end of our event. And so with that, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Brian, if you would like to take over and begin the event. Thank you, Carmel. This displaying right? Yep, you're good. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all for having me here today. Um, so I will be presenting the chapter that I've written with Laura Hoffman, another fellow at the Solomon Center on telehealth before, during, and after COVID-19. As Carmel said, today's panel is about how the healthcare system has changed from the COVID-19 pandemic. One of the very early changes from the beginning was a major shift to telehealth. Telehealth has long been viewed as the future of the US healthcare system, but at the beginning of the pandemic, when many healthcare systems were changing and patients couldn't necessarily go into the office for their routine care, providers and patients alike shifted to telehealth. But the fact is, is that the US healthcare system isn't built for telehealth. It's built for traditional in-person care when you see the doctor. So there's many legal, regulatory, and practical challenges for telehealth to be successful in the um, pandemic and to be a possibility. So during this presentation, I'll talk about many of these barriers and how we need to have legal reform at both the state and federal levels going forward to continue the use of telehealth in the future. So first, generally, what is telehealth? So telehealth is defined as the provision of medical, public health, or health education services remotely using technology. So patient and provider aren't in a room together as typical, but they're communicating either over a phone, a computer, iPad, some type of device there. Um, there's a, many different types of telehealth. There can be synchronous communications when the provider and patient are looking at their phone and communicating um, the screen. There can be asynchronous communications or remote patient monitoring, both of which send information or collect data, transmit that to a provider for review. There's also digital health applications, which you can download from some app store on your phone that'll track your activity, your nutrition, other different health data. So it covers a huge gambit of different types of health services. And while telehealth has surged in the past 20 years or so, it's existed for a very long time. As early as 1948, um, telephones were used to send radiologic images, consultations um, with psychiatrists were done over video conference. In the 1970s and 80s, NASA piloted a program in six different states to use rural health, to deliver healthcare to rural populations using telehealth. Um, in the 90s and 2000s, telehealth expanded to many other disciplines from teledermatology to telestroke, teleradiology, telepsychiatry. So telehealth has been increasing. In the years before the pandemic, it was increasing about 30 to 50% per year. But adoption and utilization were still very low. So in 2016, only a quarter percent of Medicare enrollees and less than 1% of um, enrollees in large private plans use a telehealth service. In 2019, only 10% of all patients had ever used a telehealth service. It was very low. Um, there are many reasons that there has been such low adoption and utilization of telehealth. There's been many legal and regulatory barriers. So four we'll discuss today are coverage and reimbursement, online prescribing laws, licensing laws, privacy and security. This is by no means exhaustive. There are many other barriers in terms of fraud and abuse laws, uh, informed consent policies, doctor-patient relationship creations, um, creation, creating a doctor-patient relationship. Um, but we'll focus on these four today. So first, looking at coverage and reimbursement. So many providers have long been hesitant to expand or create big telehealth programs because of insecurity and whether they would be reimbursed by um, payers. So each type of payer has its own different policies. Medicare has some many very restrictive policies for telehealth in particular. So for Medicare, um, for telehealth to be covered, it must use both audio and video technologies. It can't be an audio only phone call for certain services. Um, the patient must be in certain designated rural areas. Um, and the originating site for care for Medicare reimbursement purposes has to be a certain type of healthcare setting. So before the pandemic, patients couldn't use audio only technologies and they couldn't be at home to receive their services. So that very much is restricted telehealth use by design for the most part in Medicare. 
um, during the pandemic by necessity, patients needed to have more access. So um, HHS waived many of these requirements. The rural location requirement and the originating site requirements for um, reimbursement were waived. So now patients in an urban area could get their telehealth at home. For the most part, the video and audio requirements were still in place, um, but Medicare did permit reimbursement for certain audio-only telehealth services, particular behavioral health and patient education services. Um, the reimbursement for these visits um, with audio and video were at parity, it's the exact same rates as in-person visits, though certain telehealth um, audio-only services were at slightly lower rates. CMS also did expand the number, the types of health professionals that could provide telehealth services. Medicaid and private plans also had some barriers, a little bit less so than Medicare did, um, but also did expand their coverage of telehealth. So before the pandemic, all 50 states and DCs um, Medicaid programs covered some telehealth services um, and many private plans did as well, um, though payment parity didn't exist for most programs. Um, during the pandemic, at least 38 states adopted payment parity for Medicaid programs, and at least 16 states required payment parity for private plans. Um, additionally, both types of plans um, largely expanded their coverage of telehealth services, and private plans in particular waived co-pays for many telehealth services during the pandemic. So across the board, there was expanding of coverage, expanding of eligibility for um, telehealth reimbursement um, to really help increase access for patients. Another long barrier to telehealth has been medical licensing requirements. So typically your uh, provider is licensed in the state where they're practicing and their patient is across from them. So they're in the same location. They're like, the provider's licensed in New York, they're located in New York, they're treating a patient in New York. With telehealth, the patient may be in Massachusetts or California or Texas. And especially with the pandemic, that was gonna be a major challenge because the licensing is based off where the patient is located, not where the provider is located. So unless the provider was also licensed in that other state, there was barriers to being licensed. There were some programs already in place. The VA system um, has some licensing um, programs to make it easier for out-of-state um, providers to practice. In the VA system, the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact makes it uh, easier for pro providers to get licensed in other states, but there's still significant barriers. So during the pandemic, uh, 49 states and CMS all issued waivers of the state licensing requirements, either giving providers a path to a quick temporary license to provide for patients in their state, um, or allowing just out-of-state licensed providers to provide telehealth services. Some of those have already expired at this point, so the access to telehealth is quickly decreasing. Online prescribing has been another barrier. So what types of services can be provided on telehealth? So prescription for controlled substances in particular, um, under federal law, require in-person evaluation um, for the most part. So the telehealth has not been an option for many of these services. For certain drugs, um, FDA also has REMS requirements that make the require for a person to get a prescription for these drugs. They need either an in-person visit, some laboratory testing, or have to go in-person for dispensing of the drug. So both of these, especially in the pandemic when many healthcare settings were closed or it wasn't safe or patients didn't feel safe to go in person for these evaluations, it largely limited their access to prescription drugs, certain prescription drugs. So during the pandemic, HHS first invoked a telemedicine exception to the Controlled Substances Act. Um, this would permit providers to prescribe controlled substances to patients without a prior in-person visit, as long as it was a re real-time video telehealth visit and a few other requirements were met. So that made it possible for patients to get many controlled substances that they may need and otherwise couldn't get during the pandemic. For certain other prescription drugs, other agencies had more specific um, steps they took. So DEA um, exercised enforcement discretion, discretion and permitted audio-only telehealth prescribing for buprenorphine, a opioid use disorder treatment. Otherwise, um, patients would have to go in person to get these. Um, FDA also uh, waived some certain REMS requirements, so the in-person lab visits, laboratory tests for some drugs, but it wasn't across the board. They notified certain drug sponsors, but others, they kept these in-person requirements in place. Um, one notable example is mifepristone. 
um, which is one part in a two drug medication abortion regimen that was the REMS weren't waived. So there was still required in-person dispensing. Um, there was litigation about that. And most recently, um, the Supreme Court in January reinstated the REMS requirements, which had been um, subject to an injunction earlier in the year. The privacy and security requirements also have been a big barrier for um, telehealth platforms. Um, so HIPAA sets the privacy and security requirements for how providers and other cover entities can transmit health information. Um, so most phone call or most Zooms or FaceTimes aren't HIPAA compliant. Um, so make access to telehealth much easier for patients and providers during the pandemic. Um, HHS waived uh, or exercises enforcement discretion to waive penalties so that way more common communications technologies could be used as long as providers were acting in good faith um, and they were using a non-public facing pl platform, so Zoom, FaceTime. So with these changes, there was a huge skyrocketing in the um, use of telehealth during the COVID-19 pandemic. While the week before um, the pandemic saw 13,000 telehealth visits in a week, there was 1.7 million in the last week in April of 2020. These are across many different um, practice areas, psychiatry, gastroenterology, and neurology. Similarly, private insurance telehealth claims increased dramatically. So from April 2019 to the same time, April 2020, during the pandemic, there was an 8,000% increase in telehealth claims. So these did increase a lot in April, though the increase um, went down in July, but still above pre-pandemic levels. So this increase is great for access, but there are some concerns about disparities in access, in particular related to the technology used for um, telehealth. So elderly people of color, children, veterans, low-income populations are all less likely to have the technology at home needed for telehealth access. And with telehealth, one of the main goals to being increasing access to care, this is very concerning. We may not be reaching some of the populations that need more access the most. Um, internet coverage, which is needed especially for video visits, um, is can also be a challenge, especially for low-income populations and rural Americans that may not have broadband at home for this. Um, digital literacy, especially for the elderly, can be a challenge. Um, the ability to actually use the iPad or the computer or whatever device it is to contact a provider can be a big limit. Um, there's also concerns about telehealth for people with disabilities, whether the technology is actually accessible for them to use. And for people with limited English or who are non-English speaking, are there translators available for the app or is the app or other telehealth modality capable with translators in other languages? So as we're going forward in the future of telehealth, there's been a very, very high uh, satisfaction rating. Patients, there's a survey where over 96% were likely to recommend a telehealth visit with their provider to others. But as I've said, though there are, there's risks and many of the, the regulations that have been put in place to promote access to telehealth have already expired or some are expiring at the end of the public health emergency. So we need reform at both the state and federal levels to promote the future of telehealth. So what could some of these reforms look like? So from, many of them are from the changes that have already been put in place. So some could be made permanent. So Medicare coverage of telehealth services at home, so changing the originating site requirement and expanding the access for Medicare telehealth to patients in non-rural areas. That would be um, a great way to improve access and improve the sustainability of telehealth in the future. We also need to look at uh, medical licensing requirements again and to see whether how we want to improve access for out-of-state providers to deliver cross-border services. This could be done at state levels with easier weave-in or reciprocity, could be done at a national level, or it could be done with expansion of some of the existing programs like the IMLC. We also should think more about telehealth prescribing controlled substances. Um, some of these in-person requirements um, or the pre um, prescription of online prescribing could um, be, should be changed. We really need to think about how this can best be done. Um, one of the, in the Ryan Hate Act, the um, government was supposed to implement a program for telehealth providers to register so they could um, prescribe uh, controlled substances via telehealth. Those rules haven't been implemented, so that would be another step to be taken. Then again, some of these changes that have already been implemented should be kept temporary. So the relaxation of the HIPAA and privacy and security requirements, they were very important in the short term, so that way patients and providers could quickly make telehealth a reality. But in the long term, we need to protect the privacy and security of our patients. So we should need to rethink that. In other areas, additional research needs to be done. 
we need to do re more research on how we can improve telehealth access and prevent disparities by increasing broadband access, increasing access to technology. We also need to think about how we're going to reimburse telehealth. It's very important to do it at parity during the pandemic to incentivize providers to adapt and uptake telehealth and to make sure patients have access. But should audiovisual telehealth be the same as an in-person visit? Should audio-only telehealth um, be at the same level as an in-person visit? This has been subject to many different state and federal um, proposals for new laws to um, decide how to do this. This needs more research to decide what the right balance is. But overall, we've seen that telehealth has been successful as a healthcare delivery model. It's Patients are very happy with it, providers are very happy with it, and it's really helped patients access the healthcare they've needed during the pandemic. Uh, but we need reforms at both federal and state levels um, to make telehealth possible in the future. Uh, and we need to balance the utility um, while mitigating disparities and maintaining patients' quality of care. So all I have, thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Well, that was really interesting. And now my job is to talk uh, with you today about the impact of COVID-19 on long-term uh, care, um, the factors that have shaped that impact and what it will take to build a resilient system of long-term care moving forward. And I suspect I don't have to tell anybody on today's webinar that America's long-term care facilities have really been uh, ground zero for the pandemic, right? The very first cases we saw of COVID-19 in this country were in long-term care facilities. Uh, now, if we look at things a year later, um, and we see pretty stark patterns. COVID-19 uh, accounts uh, nursing home residents account for about a quarter of all confirmed COVID-19 deaths in this country. Just to put that in context for you, um, nursing home residents constitute less than half of 1% of the overall population. So we're seeing a really stark impact here. Um, and the question is then what explains that stark impact? Um, now, of course, you know, part of the answer to that question is that uh, nursing home residents, like other long-term care residents, are highly susceptible uh, to infection and underlying conditions uh, make them more likely to succumb to COVID-19 uh, once infected. And living in a congregate care setting impedes social distancing um, and creates a constant flow of staff uh, that create new vectors uh, for contagion. But if we really wanna understand COVID-19's impact on the long-term care population, we can't just look at susceptibility to infection and we can't even just look at the public health response. You know, that has been disappointing at times, truly dismal, right? Uh, nursing homes were not prioritized for PPE in the way we might think would be sensible um, the limited allocations FEMA made of PPA for long-term care facilities were downright laughable at times. Uh, gowns with no armholes, uh, for example. Uh, but really, if we want to understand the primary drivers of what's going on in long-term care, uh, those are related to long-standing problems in how long-term care is delivered in this country. Um, and that in turn is shaped by regulatory failures. Now, just to step back a moment, when we're talking about long-term care facilities in the US, we're really talking about two uh, major categories of facilities. Uh, one uh, are nursing homes, institutions that provide custodial care. The other are what we might call assisted living facilities, which are providing some combination of housing and meals and health-related services what the regulatory failures actually look like vary a bit uh, based on setting. Now at the assisted living uh, facility level, a key problem is under-regulation. Assisted living facilities increasingly take in high needs uh, individuals who would otherwise qualify for nursing home care, but they're regulated almost exclusively at the state level and infection control and staffing requirements are often insufficient. Thus, although most assisted living facilities will admit people who need nursing care, uh, 
Um, they are staffed primarily by patient aides and often don't have any licensed healthcare provider on their staff. And this is really a barrier to meeting residents' needs, even in normal non-pandemic times. Now, if we turn now to the nursing homes, these are highly regulated at the federal level, uh, but there's a systemic failure to enforce regulations designed to protect residents. It's not just that surveyors frequently fail to identify uh, problems or that they commonly classify problems as less severe and less widespread than they actually are, although those are certainly problems. It's also that federal regulators have chosen an approach uh, to enforcement that uses less than their full statutory authority to address known violations. So specifically the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has adopted approach that imposes no financial consequences for most regulatory violations. Instead, when violations are found, even if they're serious, facilities are typically simply directed to make corrections. And regulators may never even follow up with the facility to make sure those corrections were made. The rare fines that are levied are typically also too small to deter bad behavior. And the result is that nursing homes tend to treat regulations related to quality of care more like aspirational standards than like true mandates. So this failure to enforce outcomes for residents is especially problematic in this space uh, because federal law does not require uh, the inputs necessary, or do not directly require the inputs necessary really to achieve quality care. So for example, uh, federal government does not require nursing homes to have minimum direct care staffing levels. And that's true even though staffing has long been found to be a key predictor of quality of care and understaffing uh, a chronic problem exposing residents to serious neglect. What we're seeing coming out of COVID in terms of studies is really underscoring the importance of staffing. Um, and what we're seeing is that higher staffing levels and especially nurse staffing levels are associated with reduced presence of COVID-19 in facilities and increased ability to control a COVID-19 outbreaks where they do occur. And we're also seeing studies linking over-reliance on part-time and agency staff and staff without sick leave to the spread of COVID both between facilities and within facilities. Okay, uh, so to step back a moment, how do we move forward from this? And I think the answer is that improving long-term care is going to really require adjusting the regulatory environment to create stronger incentives for institutions to provide quality care. What would that look like? Uh, well, at the nursing home level, uh, there's a couple options I think we should be talking about. Um, one thing we need to be doing is getting serious about uh, ramping up enforcement. Um, and making sure that a broader array of events are finable events and potentially withholding new admissions um, and payments uh, to facilities found to violate protections for residents and be much more willing to do that than we're seeing regulators do it right now. Second, I think it's critical that we start tying uh, payments much more closely uh, to outcomes. You know, pay for performance schemes are pretty commonplace elsewhere in the American healthcare system, uh, but the U.S. has never seriously tried pay for performance uh, for long-term care at the federal level. You have some states offering bonuses for certain improvements, but these payments are typically too small to make those improvements economically attractive. And even in the pandemic, as we're seeing massive billions of dollars uh, moving into nursing homes, additional funds, uh, this windfall has been almost entirely devoid of conditions for the facilities. A third approach um, is to require um, minimum inputs, inputs that research indicates predict quality of care and uh, well-being of residents. Uh, for example, uh, we could, um, and especially public funding like Medicaid funding, uh, tie that funding and the amount of that funding 
to nursing homes meeting direct uh, care staffing minimums, uh, such as the 4.1 hours per resident per day of direct care staff time that experts uh, largely agree is necessary to avoid systemic neglect. Um, and perhaps adding minimum uh, nursing staffing uh, levels as well, something that would be somewhat more palatable uh, to the industry. A, a related intervention uh, would be to, in combination or, or um, instead, uh, better in combination, adopt a medical loss ratio approach in which providers would be required to use a certain percentage of funds directly on resident care. Um, much as the ACA requires insurance providers to put 80 to 85 percent of uh, funds toward providing medical care, you could have the federal government require long-term care providers that accept Medicaid or Medicare funds, and that's basically all, uh, to spend a minimum percentage of those funds on direct resident care as opposed to overhead and profit. Now, notably, each of these approaches could be adopted at the state level as well as the federal level. And we are seeing some movement at the state uh, level. So in response to some of the horror stories of the pandemic, um, New Jersey adopted legislation requiring both minimum staffing levels and 90% of funds uh, of, a, of an aggregate revenue, I should say, be spent on direct resident care. And we have pending legislation where I am here in New York uh, that would uh, require a minimum percentage of aggregate annual revenue uh, be spent on direct patient care and a minimum subset of that spending be spent specifically on wages and benefits. Of course, the viability of this type of approach depends both on calibrating those percentages correctly and on combining it with financial transparency requirements that prevent facilities from hiding profit as expenses. But if we're really gonna improve long-term care, I think we need to move beyond just improving institutions and thinking about how we make long-term care available outside of facilities. If the pandemic has taught us nothing else, it should be that in institutional care has very, very real da dangers. And yet what we see with Medicaid, which is the primary public payer of long-term care, is that we're effectively steering older adults with chronic care needs into institutions. Uh, Medicaid requires states to use um, funds to cover nursing home care, but allows them to choose whether to cover most home-based care. And states that do cover home-based care uh, may cap the number of beneficiaries served. So you have in many states, people waiting multiple years to qualify for home-based long-term care. Now that's really darn hard to justify on fiscal grounds because it's not clear it saves taxpayer money. And there's some indications it may cost more. It's also hard to square with the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, integration mandate. Um, so one thing we need to do is end this bias in favor of institutionalization. Relatedly, if we're going to make community care uh, a viable option for all Americans, then we also need to be supporting age-friendly communities and investing in the infrastructure, the transportation, the affordable housing that makes it possible for people of all ages with chronic care needs to live in integrated settings. At the end of the day, uh, none of this is gonna be easy. Um, the pandemic has uh, clearly shown us that policy makers are willing to tolerate uh, suffering and isolation of older adults. You know, consider just for a moment how uh, federal and state regulators have responded to the pandemic. Um, barring residents from having family visitors, uh, even those who are serving as supplemental care providers, even if it meant condemning residents to conditions akin to solitary confinement, uh, giving uh, nursing homes very, very broad immunity uh, from civil liability. And this of course begs the question, why? What accounts for this tolerance of suffering? And I think it's instructive there to compare what we're seeing uh, with regards to institutionalized older adults 
to what we see with children and younger disabled adults. We see this bias in favor of institutionalization persisting uh, with older adults, even as um, institutions that cater to children and younger adults with disabilities are increasingly shuttered and funds are diverted into integrated care settings. And I think ageism also helps shape this willingness to tolerate regulatory violations in institutions that cater to older adults, right? Nursing, home re nursing homes that uh, violate residents' rights, as I mentioned earlier, typically just face a slap on the wrist. By comparison, child care centers that are found to have endangered children uh, are commonly uh, subjected to uh, licensure uh, penalties, having their licenses revoked, having their facilities closed. So ultimately, creating the momentum um, to build a humane and resilient system of long-term care for the future is going to require us uh, to really convince policymakers and perhaps the general public as well that this is a worthwhile investment, uh, that these are people whose lives matter, um, and that it is worth the investment of political capital, of time and resources to build a, a true system for humane and resilient care. Uh, so I will stop there. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Professor Cohn. And I'm assuming you can hear me, which means everyone else can. So I will jump in with my presentation. Hi, everybody. My name is Matt Lawrence. I'm an associate professor at Emory University School of Law. Uh, I'm really appreciative to the Petrie Flom Center and the Solomon Center for putting this together and for all of you for joining. Uh, and I'm going to talk for 15 minutes about uh, coronavirus reveals the fiscal determinants of health. So let me talk about what I'm trying to get at. Uh, large problem obvious throughout the coronavirus pandemic is uh, underinvestment in the United States in health-related public goods. So, uh, you know, one survey sees $5.60 for every $1 invested in discrete programs that we don't invest. And I'd also, if you go look at the Public Health Law Watch COVID-19 Policy Playbook, a really fantastic kind of compilation that came out over the summer and uh, was then updated, um, if you look through, there's dozens of recommendations of how to effectively respond to coronavirus that involve money. Either it's specifically there needs to be more funding, or it's there needs to be more staff time on something, which requires funding, or there should be resources put into something. So we have this underinvestment problem. And you could then step back and say, what's the underlying problem, right? We, we, we study public health. Um, let's look upstream. Why do we not invest more in health-related public goods. And we could come up with a lot of different reasons, and I'm sure they're all at play to different degrees. So things talked about in the literature, it might just be lack of awareness. Maybe states don't know that coordinated care for diabetes would reduce amputations. That's, that's a great explanation because it means we can solve it, especially we scholars, we can solve it just by informing. We can point it out and then people will know and then there will be the investment. Um, that may also sound naive. Uh, uh, seems like racism plays a role. In many cases, the underinvestment in health-related public goods uh, most profoundly harms racial and ethnic minorities and is also uh, class differentiated. Um, so there's another explanation. How do you address that? Well, now you're really going upstream and you're, you're trying to combat systemic racism. Uh, it could be public choice failures, could be medicalization. Uh, and the, the, the one explanation I want to focus on, not as an alternative to these, but as a supplement, is our fiscal system, the, the process by which we make trade-offs about where to spend dollars. So uh, I want to focus in on that particular cause, and, and I'll talk about more I'll talk about why more in a moment, but I want to focus in on that particular cause. Note on the bottom of my screen there, uh, throughout, this isn't original research. There's, there's bits that are, that are coming from things I've worked on, but um, largely I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and uh, 
and trying to survey and talk about aspects of things other people have written about. So it won't be comprehensive, but at the bottom of my slides, I'll just have more reading on particular topics. And here I have uh, some great sources on some of these issues of causes of underinvestment, um, which will be in the recording if, if you don't have time to write them down. Um, so what do I mean when I say our fiscal system as a cause of underinvestment? The fiscal system is, is our one place, it's our process for making trade-offs about where to spend dollars. So if I say we need to spend more money on diabetes care or long-term care, the, the, you always get this, are you robbing Peter to pay Paul response? Well, where are you getting the money? And um, uh, that decision is either just an accident, nobody's really thinking about that, or to the extent we have a process, it is our fiscal system. At the federal level, it's what you think of as the budgetary process. It's also the way we arrange kind of fiscal uh, relationships between uh, jurisdictions. That's the process where we actually think, where should we get our money? Where should we spend it? How should we allocate resources around the system? And I wanna focus uh, today on four aspects of that US fiscal system for making trade-offs that structurally bias the decisions we make against public health investment. So even if uh, all of the other causes of underinvestment were not present, uh, these four aspects of our fiscal system would still lead us to, un to underinvest because they structurally, they, they bias the system against investment in health-related public goods. And, and I'm gonna talk about scorekeeping, uh, fiscal fragmentation, fiscal federalism, and then forced fragility. Uh, and then I'll kind of wrap it up. So I'm now diving in uh, fis fiscal determinants is, is one reason for underinvestment, and now I'm going to talk about four of them one by one and, and examples in the coronavirus pandemic. So first, scorekeeping. Uh, so what is scorekeeping? Well, you're familiar when the Congressional Budget Office comes out with their estimate of what a law will cost, or the budget committees actually have a formal role. This is within the federal legislative process, uh, laws and practices that estimate the revenue and expenditure impacts of legislation for purposes of, of how hard or easy it is to pass and for purposes of how it's evaluated. Uh, and uh, that's biased against public health investment in a number of ways uh, that Tim Westmoreland uh, has written about, I have at the bottom. Um, uh, there's a short time horizon, so it will, uh, it, for example, if you only look at costs over a 10 year period, or benefits over a 10 year period, you'll catch all the costs of some public good investment like building a new hospital or a uh, 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 better transportation system. You'll, you'll capture all the costs, but the benefits might accrue over many years and, and you won't catch those. Similarly, uh, there's this solipsistic focus only on the impacts internalized to the federal government. So if you uh, vaccinate somebody and prevent them both from acquiring coronavirus and giving it to other people, uh, for the budgetary process, that only counts as a savings, the, the saved treatment costs of coronavirus, if they're a Medicare patient or the person they give it to is a Medicare patient and the federal government pays 100% of Medicare. If the coronavirus case is a private insurance patient, that's off the books for Medicare. That doesn't get counted in, in the budget process. Uh, and an example of that, which, which I have to flag, it's in um, Tim Westmoreland's article surveying these scorekeeping biases is he said, because of these biases, the federal government is gonna underinvest in preventing an epidemic because the benefits of preventing an epidemic are widely dispersed across the entire population, but the costs are just the federal government and the, and the scorekeeping process will ignore those. Uh, and sadly that came to pass um, uh, uh, and, and was perhaps a little prophetic on his, case, on his part. So to explain my clip art, which may be obvious at this point, the umpire who's, who's keeping score is missing things, is missing important things. Um, so that's scorekeeping. Um, next up, another fiscal bias is fiscal fragmentation. Fragmentation is a classic kind of defining problem in, in health and health care. And I'm focusing on fiscal fragmentation, which is that um, the responsibility for costs across the healthcare system is segmented. And we're familiar with how segmented it is. Medicaid versus Medicare, federal versus state public versus private, different payers, different treatments. Uh, and, and in healthcare, a lot of energy goes into trying to bridge that, but it's extremely costly to do. Um, why do we put energy into trying to bridge it? 
if you have fragmented costs, responsibility for costs, then that means that the entity uh, who might be in a position to make an investment is not the one who recoups that investment, which either means they don't have an interest in making the investment, or it means they can't make it. Uh, a, a nursing home that could, to, to pick up off of Professor Cohn's point, a nursing home that might be able to do a lot, uh, a lot valuable, may not have the resources based on its current reimbursement structure to make those investments that perhaps save, let's say, the time and energy of family caretakers uh, for some of the residents in the nursing home. Uh, so uh, you get this mismatch that in economic terms means you uh, underinvest in uh, positive externalities. Uh, example of that in the coronavirus pandemic is what happened with surveillance testing for employers and schools. Insurers said that surveillance testing for employers and schools is uh, not medically necessary. To go back to an old insurance debate, uh, they said it's not medically necessary. And then employers and schools mostly declined to provide for surveillance testing, uh, even though it, it would be very valuable. Again, they're not internalizing all the costs of, of the benefits of that, but, but they internalize the costs. And in a, this survey I cite on the slide of employers and schools, the reason for not providing for surveillance testing was cost. Um, uh, whether, whether that was an excuse or not, I don't know, but it makes sense that at some point you simply can't afford it. Um, so, uh, and there again, you know, the economists, you're always talking about the pie and we shouldn't, in dividing the pie, shrink the pie. We want to make the pie bigger. And my fragmentation, you know, clip art there is just that the pie is all divided up. There, there's, uh, in our system, not necessarily one entity that's looking at that whole pie and trying to maximize it. Um, everybody's maximizing their little piece. Uh, that's another bias against investment that tees up a question. And if you go back to the most law, cited law review, uh, the, the Coase theorem was, uh, in theory, those sorts of externalities should be fixed if people coordinate, if they negotiate uh, and they make deals. But that deal making can be very difficult. In our system, you either have the federal government or the state government that might step in and think about everyone. It might think about everyone's cost, the whole pie together. That tees up the next issue, which is fiscal federalism. This is really a problem for states. Why can't a state just step up and, and make the investments itself that are best for the people in the state? And a challenge that states face is first, that their revenues and their expenditures, what they take in and what they put out are counter cyclical which means that when there's a recession, when the economy goes down, a state's revenues go down because its tax base goes down. It's property tax values, it's income tax, they go down. But when there's a recession, what else happens? The state's costs go up because enrollment in Medicaid and other welfare programs goes up. So the state finds itself in a crunch. It's, it's bringing in less money, but it's spending more. Simultaneously, most state constitutions forbid the states from borrowing. And those two things and some others kind of conspire to make states very poorly situated to make those kind of long-term best interests of the community investments because they just lack the money. Even if they wanted to, uh, they, they don't have the fiscal flexibility to do it. Uh, what that means is that the federal government is, is kind of the one that can, that can step in and play that role. More on that in a moment. Uh, an example of this uh, you know, challenge of states being the ones playing that role from the coronavirus pandemic was what happened with PPE. The, the federal government sort of stepped aside in providing and acquiring PPE for states. And then states go out of the marketplace, they tried to do it themselves, and they wound up uh, competing with each other and driving up prices. Uh, so that's the fiscal federalism problem. Uh, and then um, actually bear with me for 30 seconds, and I'm going to switch slides. Um, so be right back. I thought I'd get 15 minutes with this guy and that wasn't quite right, but he got us almost there. So the last point is forced fragility. Why isn't the federal government doing more? And um, one problem for the federal government is that our constitution, our budget laws, our norms, they all push that our federal spending programs are made fragile. We enact one year of spending at a time or two years at a time. 
And we largely do that to preserve Congress's role in the separation of powers, the power of the purse. That power of purse is important. Congress's role is important. But that forcing that fragility into spending programs is problematic for health and public health because those one year appropriations, they're inherently unreliable. And then Congress or the president often failed to enact extensions. Even look at the COVID relief, uh, whereas back in spring, Congress and the president could have enacted an automatic relief program that would lapse based on some economic indicator or something. They instead based it on time, preserving flexibility and power for themselves. But then the result is disruption when they don't enact something. Um, relatedly, you can never cement public health investments. So uh, I recently moved to Georgia, buy a house. That's my house now, it's protected by the takings clause. But if the government wants to give money to public health, that might be taken away the next year or the year after in the legislative process. If somebody has some ability to kind of outcompete it. That happened with the Public Health Prevention Fund, uh, which seeing I'm getting low on time, I'll say that um, Bill Sage and Tim Westmoreland have a great summary of this um, history here, but um, Jeannie Lambrew and Hillary Clinton originally kind of pushed that we need a really stable funding source for public health programs. That found its way into the Affordable Care Act as a, as a large funding source, the Public Health Prevention Fund. But once on the books, it was easy for Congress or relatively easy for Congress to come amend it. So after that was enacted in 2010, the Public Health Prevention Fund, Congress came back a couple of times and they raided it. They, they raided it for, um, uh, they raided it for uh, the doc fix and they raided it for um, uh, the 2017 tax cuts. And the result was a, a less well-funded CDC. What effect did that have on you know testing and, and other issues? I'm not sure, but uh, the CDC's former director when they when they made the cut said CDC won't be able to protect us without this funding. Um, and uh, and there certainly were issues. So so to kind of wrap up here on these four, fiscal determinants, you might kind of step back and say, why are we so focused on money and budget and the, on these fiscal determinants? Certainly the primary determinants of health are not necessarily fiscal, but why focus on this contribution? And my answer is simply because the laws and norms that affect these decisions and processes, they're controlled by different actors who consider different sorts of values than the usual or, or the kind of more ordinary fights about investment. And I've got there a, a uh, train operator with different levers. In health law, we talk about how the, the healthcare system, Mark Hall describes it as the clattering train. It's kind of runaway train that's hard to control. And, uh, you know, the task is not just to see where it's going, but figure out what are the levers that we can pull to try to get it on course. And uh, I would submit that uh, fiscal laws are one of those levers we should keep in mind. And as an example of that, um, optimism note, uh, just recently, a couple months ago, House Rules Resolution 2021, um, the House of Representatives adopted a change to the budget rules that allows the chair of the budget committee to exempt costs in scorekeeping uh, for points of order related to COVID-19 or public health consequences resulting from climate change. And um, uh, AOC came out after that and said, this is a really big deal. This is going to affect a lot of legislation going forward, which might well be right. And again, is a sign that there's sorts of different levers to potentially pull here um, uh, to, to, to get us closer to the right track. And with that, I'll say thank you uh, very much for joining. And I'd love to get questions, comments, anything like that. Um, uh, uh, and look forward to the Q&A. Thank Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, uh, kudos to Professor Lawrence for that very deft juggling of baby care and presentation uh, duties. That was very impressive. Um, so anyway, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for um, to the conference organizers for organizing this really interesting seminar series and for including me as a participant. Um, I'll be talking about an issue that has been challenging our healthcare delivery system for a while, but that the COVID-19 pandemic has made uh, far more salient. Uh, and that is the awkward and sometimes dysfunctional interaction between uh, the world of medicine and the medical sphere and uh, the world of public health. Um, the question that I'm gonna be looking at in particular um, is to what extent 
do physicians have duties to non-patients and to improve the health of the community and general public health uh, versus their very clear uh, duties to uh, the patients in front of them. Uh, this is a question that has continually vexed courts and scholars and policymakers. Um, and as I said, has become a lot more salient now uh, during the pandemic um, because there are inevitable tensions for physicians in trying to do what's best for their patients and in also trying to safeguard the community's health. Um, so one, one caveat I should get out at the beginning, um, I acknowledge that often a physician who works uh, to better her patient's health um, can sometimes uh, improve public health as well. Um, that may baseline aggregate improve the, the community's health and also treating a patient, for example, with infectious disease may reduce the risk of transmission to others. Um, but uh, I think it's deceptively simple to say if physicians care for their patients, they're also helping public health. Uh, there are unavoidable uh, situations of misalignment where pursuit of patient care goals uh, conflicts with public health. And it's those areas of contestable uh, misalignment uh, that I'm particularly uh, focused on. Um, uh, let me give you an example uh, from the pandemic where I um, think this uh, kind of illustrates this tension between what physicians feel they should do for their patients uh, versus safeguarding the health of the community. So think back to a year ago um, when uh, things were really getting bad with COVID. Um, so a, a lot of public health authorities, including the CDC, uh, were advising that elective surgery should be paused or halted. Um, obviously what is an elective procedure is uh, subject to much debate, but the idea was uh, certainly non-essential procedures could be paused or put on hold. Uh, the idea was to uh, preserve PPE and oxygen and other critical resources needed for uh, caring for COVID patients and also trying to minimize uh, virus transmission opportunities uh, by having additional uh, community members come into the hospitals. Um, despite this guidance and urging that uh, uh, physicians uh, stop elective procedures, uh, a lot of physicians um, I shouldn't say a lot, but some physicians um, steadfastly refused um, and, and kept going forward with uh, what um, many public health authorities viewed as uh, less essential procedures, such as uh, Tommy John surgery, uh, spinal uh, decompression, and, and other procedures like that. Um, there was big news about, for example, uh, professional athletes getting uh, Tommy John surgery uh, during this time. Um, uh, another example uh, at this time of March of last year, um, a lot of dermatology practices nationwide uh, were uh, staying open. And uh, despite Professor Knox's discussion about how telehealth uh, was an interesting um, new uh, uh, alternative we've been exploring in the pandemic, uh, despite the American Academy of Dermatology's guidance to dermatology practices, hey, you should be using telehealth more or, or uh, just don't have these patients come in, uh, several dermatology clinics um, refused and, and, and stayed open. Part of that may have been because of the better reimbursement they were getting at the time for in-person care than telehealth care. Uh, and the New York Times did an investigation of several of these clinics and, and found that many of them were uh, owned by equity investors and uh, the financial pressures there may have been um, causing some of these practices to stay open. Now, all this may come as no surprise to you. You might say, um, hey, uh, physicians and healthcare systems are, are businesses just like everyone else. Add them to the list of restaurants, bars, and bowling alleys, and everyone else who's been chafing at uh, restrictions on what they can do during the pandemic. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's very surprising, I would think, and even counterintuitive to think that physicians uh, with their medical training um, would go so uh, radically against uh, public health advice, right? Um, and I think this is uh, reflective of, of a, a larger problem. Um, the American College of Surgeons uh, issued very thoughtful guidance when it was trying to urge its members to slow down with elective procedures, um, saying, you know, look, during a pandemic, it's no matter, uh, it's no longer a time of doing what's best for each patient, but thinking about what's best for the group. And it acknowledged that this is something that many uh, physicians are unaccustomed to do and unaccustomed to thinking that way. And I would say not only are they unaccustomed to thinking that way, but law and policy almost uh, encourages them not to think that way. Uh, and that's problematic. Uh, so these uh, physicians who were, um, you know, trying to do the best for their patients and claiming that that's what they were doing, uh, the best for their patients and ignoring public health advice, uh, 
I think it's wrong to dismiss them as outliers or a small minority. Uh, I think they can credibly claim that law and, and, and policy actually largely supported what they were doing. Um, and, and that's the problem. And, and that this is a problem that pervades uh, the public health space and is not just limited to what happened uh, during COVID-19. Um, so there's this general message in uh, law that physicians should put their patients first. Um, yes, they uh, at times are acknowledged to have duties to non-patients and to the community. Um, so I'm not saying that those duties are not there, but they're kind of elusive. They technically exist, but they kind of appear in an ad hoc fashion. Uh, and um, they are inevitably, when there's tension, viewed as inferior to the doctor's uh, direct duties to her patients. And so it's hard to say pragmatically if they really matter much in swaying physician decision making. Uh, moreover, um, the elusiveness of these public health duties combined with this strong message that doctors should put their patients first, the, the patient primacy directive, in combination, this actually facilitates the externalization of health risks um, to the general community in a problematic way. Also, uh, the directive to put patients first, I think sometimes gives physicians cover and can mask um, reasons that they do not want to engage in public health, such as financial reasons, like there, there just may not be a good business model and good reimbursement for public health action on their part, and also concerns about professional authority and public health kind of overriding uh, physicians' clinical autonomy. All right, so really brief, you know, the, the law is pretty, pretty clear that uh, physicians really only have obligations to uh, patients they form treatment relationships with. Um, some, um, some view the doctor-patient relationship as a fiduciary relationship, or at least a quasi-fiduciary relationship, which would impose uh, obligations to, um, particularly the fiduciary's duty of loyalty to put the, the, the patient first. Um, and the general uh, duties we think of um, through tort law and otherwise uh, that physicians have, such as uh, non-abandonment and care and confidentiality really only arise after a treatment relationship is formed with a patient. Um, therefore, if we're thinking about what the doctor's relationship is to members of the community or non-patients, um, there, there is not much, much there. To the extent we do think that the physician may have secondary duties to the community, um, uh, the message we usually get, um, for example, in, in uh, scholarly commentary is to advise the physician to still put the patient first or uh, restructure things uh, to avoid the dual loyalty conflict. So for example, sports medicine physicians who may work for an athletic team and have dual loyalties to the team and then to the individual um, patient they're caring for. I know the Petri Flom Center did a lot of work on this. Um, uh, the the uh, recommendation often is to know, uh, disaggregate those roles and have two physicians, one who cares for the athlete and one physician who advises the team generally, right? Be, to just avoid this uh, conflict altogether. Um, so, there is case law and uh, broad sounding language in that case law at times that says physicians do have public health duties, particularly in the uh, cases where physicians treat patients with infectious disease, uh, and then uh, the patient infects someone else. And does that third party then have a right to sue the physician? Um, there is, as I said, open-ended language there that could be understood to be kind of suggesting that physicians have pretty strong public health duties to members of the community. But when you really parse those cases and look at more recent cases, um, it's hard to say that there's very robust public health duties there. First of all, what's required of the physician is often narrow to just advise the patient of the risk that uh, her infection poses to others rather than more affirmative steps like um, warn um, uh, non-patients or control um, the infectious patient's conduct uh, to a large degree. And here I have two representative more modern cases where uh, the court said really the physician had to do nothing um, uh, other than advise the patient uh, uh, of the risk um, and in terms of protecting third parties. So it's really hard to generalize from those cases to say physicians have a broad public health duty to protect the public health at large. Uh, there is statutory law that imposes um, occasional uh, public health duties on physicians. Um, I'll talk about their disease reporting obligations in a sec, um, but uh, these are ad hoc. For example, the Model State Emergency Health Powers Act adopted in many states uh, permits state health directors to commandeer the services of physicians to enlist them in uh, activities like quarantine and isolation, but um, that only happens in declared public health emergencies and not um, in, in more non-emergency times where public health risks may still be um, there and, and important and, and need to be addressed. Um, and um, uh, th there's a limited reach of these statutory obligations. 
uh, Medical Practice Acts impose very few requirements on physicians uh, to act for non-patients. And there's just a general dearth of any licensure action uh, being taken against a physician um, for harm to a non-patient, right? Um, there is a kind of ad hoc um, uh, examples in some medical licensing statutes. For example, uh, New York and North Carolina permit physicians to prescribe uh, opioid antagonists to non-patients and therefore form a, a kind of relationship with a non-patient to prevent overdoses. Uh, but those are permissive statutes, not obligating the physician to act. And again, as I said, these examples are few and far between. Um, briefly about medical ethics, uh, the AMA Code of Medical Ethics uh, has a core principle that physicians should uh, work for the betterment of public health. So that sounds awfully promising, but that's immediately undercut by the next core principle in the AMA Code of Medical Ethics, that a, a physician should regard responsibility to the patient as paramount. Um, the AMA Ethics Code underwent reorganization a few years ago. There's a, a new chapter eight that specifically speaks to physicians' obligations to work for the health of the community, uh, such as example, uh, assessing patients' fitness to drive and participating in screening for HIV. But if you really parse those opinions, uh, they always have language that the doctor is still supposed to put patient welfare first uh, and give very few examples, if any, about where um, the health of the community would ever trump um, doing what's best for the patient. Um, there is alternative guidance, such as a guidance from the Public Health Leadership Society Code, um, but that uh, 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 guidance is not even meant to apply to private physicians in the clinic, more to physicians, for example, who work for public health departments. Um, another example moving from COVID where I think we see this problem of um, uh, physicians' elusive public health duties and the strong doing what's best for the patient directive uh, facilitating health risks to the community is physicians' notoriously poor historical compliance with disease reporting laws. Every state has a mandatory law that physicians must report, um, including often named reporting, um, certain patients who have certain infectious disease to state public health authorities. And yet uh, we've had uh, low compliance by physicians for many years. Uh, this may be for the fact that there's very little reimbursement for doing this, there are time constraints, um, Physicians may think that other providers like clinical labs will do it, but it, it's very problematic nonetheless. Um, and some of the concerns are uh, voiced on, well, uh, I, I don't wanna jeopardize my patient, right? Um, by reporting them, even though there's broad, broad uh, exceptions in the law, for example, in the HIPAA law, expressly permitting this type of reporting. Um, now you might say that these laws are not really enforced, so why should physicians comply with them? But you know, there are reasons to intrinsically comply with laws, even if they're not, um, robustly enforced. And here I think physicians see little incentive for, um, for protecting public health and, and their default is to privilege uh, the interests of the patient in front of them. Um, and uh, it's problematic because a good public health system depends on uh, a good surveillance system and physicians are at the front line of that surveillance. In fact, uh, some um, things that you want to surveil, uh, you can't even rely on clinical labs to make the reports about because uh, you need the doctor's clinical impressions or just uh, the doctor to report a suspected case, even if there's not a confirmatory test yet. Um, another example, real briefly, would be the opiate epidemic. There are many reasons behind that. Um, uh, financial incentives offered by uh, pharma companies to prescribers to overprescribe opioids. Um, the uh, Joint Commission accreditation standards that may have um, overemphasized uh, pain relief uh, in terms of um, other standards for dealing with chronic pain patients, et cetera. Uh, but uh, this idea of privileging the patient, I think, um, at the expense of public health is, is there as well. As Dr. Anna Lemke wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine, in, in many instances during the height of the opioid epidemic, physicians were prescribing more medications than they needed to their patients and, and were fully aware that these medications were being diverted and were prescribing them anyway. Part of this may have been the blinker devotion to wanting to do what's best for the patient. Um, and uh, we even have some scholars who've argued uh, that um, when it comes to opioid prescribing, the potential harm to society should not factor into uh, the doctor's decision at all. It should only be about um, providing a, pop, a proper pain relief access to the patient. And we've seen physician resistance to laws trying to uh, deal with the opioid epidemic, such as prescription drug monitoring programs often voiced along the lines of, this will interfere with the doctor-patient relationship. And this is where I think we see another example where um, the patient primacy directive, I, I need to do what's best for my patient, is used to kind of um, 
ignore public health considerations when really what's going on is just concerns of clinical autonomy and kind of interference with the physician's professional judgment, which is part of the public health uh, medical tension. All right, I acknowledge that there are many challenges in shifting to a more robust uh, public health duty for physicians. Would this mean that physicians are now liable to every member of the public when something goes wrong? Um, but I think we can um, deal with that, for example, by having prudent intermediaries uh, represent the public's interest here rather than individual uh, patient lawsuits, such as state boards of medicine or state attorney generals. Um, but there are uh, other challenges here as well, uh, such as loss of patient trust if patients realize that uh, their doctor may be putting the public health interest uh, a little more prominently on the scale uh, and not uh, always privileging uh, the patient. Um, uh, but uh, I think there are countervailing uh, reasons uh, nonetheless to more aggressively advance um, the public health duty of physicians. Um, in the paper, I go through some of these that I find less convincing, such as maybe this is a social contract expectation of physicians because their med medical education is largely underwritten by the government and they have certain perks and maybe they owe something back, or this may spread the burden of public health protection more equitably among physicians. I think some of these rationales are, are helpful, but where I end up, and this is where I'm gonna end my uh, presentation, what I think is uh, most important is the physician's role in dispensability. As Professor Lawrence's presentation made clear, we have significant underinvestment in our public health system right now. Um, and our public health system is really largely and surprisingly dependent on private actors, right? We have a, um, epidemiologists and contract tracers and a few other officials who may be directly employed by state public health departments, which themselves have been chronically underfunded. But to a large degree, our public health response has depended on the actions of private pharmacies, hospitals, and at the critical nerve center of all this, I think, is the private physician. Um, the private physician in, performs incredibly important public health functions. There are sentinels who can be privy to public health threats long before uh, others. Um, and um, they also are gatekeepers. You know, there's no more powerful um, lever in the whole healthcare system than the doctor's prescribing pen. Um, so being able to turn the switch on or off for which patients get opioids, which patients get antibiotics, uh, is very, very critical for downstream public health effects. And just leveraging uh, society's limited public health resources, um, uh, the physician's prescribing authority uh, can weigh heavily there. And while we often associate gatekeeping with healthcare cost control, it is critically important for public health protection as well. And physicians are the kind of gatekeeper uh, above all else. Finally, uh, physicians have that learned intermediary status that is very important. They can kind of communicate best to their patients uh, about public health matters, and they may have patient trust in doing so. Uh, so for example, in trying to curb the public health threat of antibiotic resistance and ineffective antibiotic medications, a physician can lean into her uh, learned an intermediary status and counsel a patient, look, I'm not, not gonna prescribe this antibiotic for you, not only because it may not be effective, but because it will contribute to antibiotic resistance, which is bad for community health. Um, we also have seen uh, during uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic in trying to overcome vaccine hesit hesitancy in communities of color, uh, the effective deployment of healthcare providers of color who can be learned intermediaries here um, and get uh, those communities more on board with um, uh, vaccines. So um, combine these three functions, I think, are critical for public health protection. At the moment, they can only really best be uh, performed by physicians. I don't think physicians are necessarily uh, well suited for public health protection. Um, and in fact, there's a longstanding difficulty in the way physicians are trained for public health, which is not much at all. Uh, what I'm really coming down on is a pragmatic matter in the current public health system we have, uh, they are our best alternative. And I think we need to make better use of them. But at the, mo at the moment, law and policy is sending uh, a, a very different message uh, of patient first and unfortunately public health last. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Uh, thank you, um, and good afternoon. I'd like to thank the Petrie Flom Center for hosting the seminar series and the invitation to this event, uh, and to my esteemed panelists for setting the stage uh, so nicely for my talk today. Uh, I'll be sharing with you some of the work that I've been doing with 
uh, Bill Sage on risk responsibility, resilience, respect to COVID-19 and the protection of healthcare workers. Serving as the last line of defense, frontline healthcare workers in New York City experienced unimaginable trauma in the spring of 2020, much of it related to personal protection. There were supply chain issues uh, involving personal protective equipment or PPE, which we refer to as masks, gowns, gloves, and face shields. Uh, and in some cases, healthcare workers were forced to take extreme measures to find and preserve PPE, with some hospitals having mandatory conservation measures, uh, such as the reuse, reuse of disposable masks. And in one New York City hospital, it was reported that nurses wore garbage bags instead of gowns. Now, not only does this cause moral distress, but in some cases resulted in ultimate harm, death. So this protection is critical, given that in the United States alone, there have been over 3,500 documented healthcare worker deaths and sadly counting. And by most accounts, this number is grossly underestimated. And as you can see here of the demographics reported, roughly three quarters are nurses and support staff with the majority coming from hospitals and long-term care facility locations. Um, and some think, well, of course there must be protections for healthcare workers. And the answer is yes, but are they enough? So that takes us to talking about OSHA. So the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. So currently there is only one OSHA standard enforcing the, protect the protection of workers from infectious disease. And it applies only to bloodborne pathogens. So this was created to protect healthcare workers from exposures to diseases contracted through the blood, such as HIV and hepatitis. But shortly after the H1N1 flu pandemic in 2009, uh, OSHA began work on an infectious disease standard that would apply to all contractable infectious agents, uh, hence COVID. But due to the lengthy standard making process, this standard was still in the works in 2017 when the Trump administration removed it from the regulatory agenda and placed it on the quote, long-term action list, where it still lies today with no regulatory updates since that time. So this is where the COVID-19 Workers First Protection Act of 2020 comes into play. This was introduced uh, last uh, summer, so summer of uh, 2020 as part of the CARES Act, but it was not voted on. Uh, however, its intent was clear. The legislation mandates that OSHA provides a temporary emergency standard to protect workers. It also protects workers in healthcare occupations from similar emergencies in the future by requiring OSHA to then proceed with implementing a more permanent standard uh, after the act was put into place. Uh, so now fast forward to uh, January 21st of this year, uh, when we then saw from President Biden an executive order on protecting worker health and safety with very similar provisions. Uh, the direct res result was that in the very ne next week, so in late January, OSHA released updated guidance on how to prevent exposure and the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. And that's entitled Protecting workers, guidance on mitigating and preventing the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. Uh, the trick here is this guidance is not mandatory and does not have the same legal effect as an OSHA standard. Uh, however, it does give some insight into what OSHA expects to include in an emergency temporary standard, uh, which the Biden administration want, wants OSHA to consider and potentially uh, implement this week. So we'll be keeping an eye out for that. Now shifting gears a bit, taking a closer look at the COVID-19 experience of healthcare workers in New York City, examining what happened, what went wrong, and consider some of the root causes uh, with some ideas for the future. Uh, while some of the items uh, here on this list uh, may seem obvious, the problematic part is the extent of these challenges for healthcare workers during the surge. Uh, so to expand ICU capacity, uh, the surge required hospitals to convert conference rooms, lobbies, cafeterias. Uh, we even saw tents anywhere we could 
uh, to create space for ICU patients. And at its height, some hospitals had more than quadrupled their numbers of ICU patients. Uh, the speed and volume of the uh, patients admitted to the New York City hospitals placed a significant strain on ICU staffing. And not to mention that workers that were testing positive or might have been calling out sick due to ill family members. So New York City hospitals brought in critical care staff from across the country. So ICU trained nurses left jobs in sometimes uh, smaller or more rural hospitals uh, for New York City, where they could earn as much as $10,000 a week. So hospitals that were able to afford it, they're supplemented, therefore supplemented their workforces, while hospitals without as many resources were unable to offer their staff the much needed relief. So which ties to resources in general? Prior to the pandemic, many hospitals managed their supply chains on a just-in-time basis. This meant that when the surge hit, hospitals already lacked a stock of supplies and essential medical equipment on which to draw. And we're not always prepared from an operational perspective uh, to acquire them quickly. For the amount of critical care delivered, hospitals needed almost five times the number of their typical ICU equipment and supplies and therefore leaving staff in potentially dangerous situations, as noted earlier with PPE. So these physical and psychological effects of shortages were worsened by a high degree of uncertainty in the early stages of the pandemic, especially when the CDC guidance was evolving. So beyond the risk of infection, there was also an emotional toll um, at both at, uh, work and at home for healthcare workers. Uh, some saw more deaths than they had seen uh, during their, in, in those few weeks during the surge in April than they had in their entire 30-year careers. And one large study in New York City reported that nurses experienced the psychological toll more than others. Long hours, faster pace, lack of sleep, and emotional exhaustion really pushed some of the frontline workers to their breaking point. And hospital staff look to their employers for guidance and protection, not professional associations or the local government. So depending on the circumstances, those conditions that I just mentioned can reinforce professional pride and build teamwork and staff coming together, uh, or uh, can cause profound sadness and inflict moral injury. Uh, and then sometimes uh, both. So this was a difficult tension to manage. Um, health professionals are even less prepared to balance risks of harming patients with risks of harming themselves. And these types of crisis decisions are a big part of the challenge of protecting healthcare workers in the pandemic uh, while effectively caring for patients at the same time. So an example of uh, this dilemma is clear with the story of ventilators. So with a dwindling supply, uh, staff reportedly had to think crit critically about ventilator use or look to splitting anesthesia ventilators to treat multiple patients. Uh, so it's worth noting here that there's little enforceable law to either reinforce or guide such professional ethics. Uh, so in considering this stressful period, there are a couple areas that are worthy of exploration exploration when it comes to the root causes of the physical and psychological vulnerability of healthcare workers. So first here is structural unfairness. Why were some hospitals okay, uh, but others not? Uh, so nationally recognized facilities clearly had the cash reserves, influential positions, wealthy trustees, and other connections to hire those staff mentioned and uh, get supplies if needed. In contrast, some of the public institutions typically located in underserved areas were overcrowded, uh, understaffed, and short of critical supplies, um, therefore increasing that moral burden of the healthcare providers working there. There were also inequities within individual health systems, where due to various constraints, um, not all hospitals in the system were treated equally due to professional hierarchies, uh, safety system failures and or regulatory practices. 
Um, and as we heard earlier, this pandemic has sorely reminded the United States of our underinvestment in community and public health, as well as chronic and long-term care facilities. One other area worthy of discussion is uh, professional vulnerability. So healthcare professionals continued willingness to put themselves in harm's way for the benefit of their patients. Uh, the expectations of individual perseverance and heroism cannot always be fulfilled without consequences. And in a sustained and serious pandemic such as this, a heroism-based paradigm for accepting personal risk is misleading. And in our current situation, professionalism then becomes both a strength and a weakness. So relying solely on resilience is unwise and expecting heroism is, uh, from each individual is inviting exhaustion and self-doubt that may become burnout or even worse. So to sum up here, there are some lessons to learn and, and certainly hypothesis hypotheses to explore. Uh, systemic improvements in health equity may be slow in coming, but measures to stem the inequalities that harmed patients and workers during this pandemic are possible. Uh, so an important first step is collaboration and collective investment among healthcare systems uh, and uh, the U.S. healthcare system as a whole. Uh, and for hospitals to look at sharing staff and supplies uh, in an organized and equitable manner. Uh, COVID-19 is a call to reduce siloing in health professional oversight and ethics, building connections among sectors and promoting new forms uh, of engagement. Workplace redesign efforts are needed that benefit both staff and patients uh, using uh, technology innovations such as telehealth, as we heard earlier, all of which will require a cultural change and budgetary flexibility. Uh, successful intervention also requires a uh, cultural adaptation in the expectation that healthcare workers have superhuman qualities with no pain, uh, no rest, no fear, um, and this must change. And, and last but not least, a post-COVID regulatory landscape for hospitals uh, should attempt to bridge healthcare-specific entities to more general government mechanisms for workplace support. Um, especially when it comes to post-traumatic stress disorder, which we expect to see more of in the coming months, and ongoing mental health needs. Uh, but I believe that there is help for the, uh, hope for the future, and even though the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed real vulnerabilities uh, in the healthcare workforce, its resilience and commitment to care just unthinkable circumstances have really energized efforts uh, to improve the healthcare practice environment. Um, and my pandemic experience confirms that patient experience, population health, and cost are all dependent on that fourth prong of quadruple aim an engaged and supported healthcare workforce. Um, and I'd like to conclude today. Uh, by dedicating this talk to uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Lorna Breen. Uh, in a period of three weeks uh, back in April of 2020, Lorna treated uh, confirmed COVID patients, contracted COVID herself, and returned to an overwhelming number of incredibly sick patients. She kept going back until she literally could no longer stand. Uh, Lorna died by suicide on April 26, 2020. And the mission of this foundation is to reduce the burnout of healthcare workers and safeguard their well being and job satisfaction in the future. Thank you for your time today. All right. Thank you to all of our panelists. Those were some fantastic presentations. And I'm mindful of the time. So we are going to wrap it up with one question that's directed to the entire panel. The Biden administration certainly has a lot in front of them as they think about the future of healthcare, both in terms of the pandemic, but also in terms of problems that existed prior to the pandemic, which I think several of you flagged in your presentations. 
if you had to give them advice about how to sort through changes that were made in response to the pandemic that would be good to keep or build on versus changes that were appropriate for an emergency context, but perhaps shouldn't be kept, what might be some of the guiding thoughts or principles you would suggest they keep in mind? Nina, I saw your hand raised. So I would say in the long-term care context, amid the pandemic, we see a, a massive restriction of enforcement of quality standards, which was exactly the wrong thing to do in the moment. Uh, so we need to swing the pendulum, not only back to where it was before, but even farther and use the statutory authority that already exists to do what needs to be done and to make sure that what taxpayers are paying for in terms of quality of care is what residents are getting. Ryan? Um, so for the telehealth context, I'd say first, um, for the Medicare requirements, keep in place the waiver of the originating site so patients can access telehealth, telehealth at home, but also to look at the steps to increase access in terms of the technology and the broadband needed. <clears throat> so telehealth can reach more people and really serve its um, purpose of promoting access to healthcare. And I might also add very broadly, you know, clearly uh, there were a lot of regulations relaxed uh, all at once, and we've already seen some of them put back in place. So I think big picture, um, at least taking a look at what was relaxed uh, and then work on the priorities, because I fear that that first step is not even happening. Richard? Um, I would say work with the reimbursement system to change the business model so that physicians have better incentives for engaging in public health activities, such as um, Medicare and Medicaid bonuses for compliance with antibiotic prescribing guidelines and, and numerous other examples that have been floated. All right, and Matt, you have the last word on the panel. Well, in that case, I'm going to push the bounds of the question a little bit and flag that the Petrie Flom's blog, uh, The Bill of Health, has a symposium on Biden's health agenda coming up, where different scholars will have specific proposals for Biden's health agenda. And one I have in mind is that, uh, as I mentioned, the, you know, there's annual funding for a lot of programs like SNAP, Medicaid, the Indian Health Service. And so if there's a shutdown, they, they become hostages. And I would say that now is the time to protect those programs against being taken hostage next time that there's a divided government and they become appealing sources of leverage. So that's uh, my suggestion. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for the plug on our upcoming symposium on the Biden administration and its healthcare policies. I encourage everybody to go to the Petrie Flom website, where if you click on the link that says blog, you can go to the Bill of Health blog. We are actually currently hosting a digital symposium on the future of the post-pandemic healthcare workforce, which I think really goes to both Richard and Vicki's presentations. These are some personal reflections, structural reflections from healthcare workers on what they experienced over the last year and what they think to be moving forward. And shortly we're going to launch the Biden digital symposium. I want to thank everybody for presenting at this panel. This was really fantastic, as well as all of the attendees for joining us for this conversation. Thank you all.